2 and 3, looking at the seven letters to the seven churches. Um, I entitled this series, The Worthy Church. Um, and, and we've been looking at these seven churches. And now we reach the last church, the church of Laodicea. Um, and, and, and this one's going to be a good one. This is, this is probably one of the toughest letters that was written to all the churches. Uh, but before we get there, um, let me ask you a question. Have you ever de dealt with a delusional person? A delusional person. Have you ever dealt with a delusional person? Like, let me read you a definition. Maybe you don't know what the definition is, so let me read the definition. It says a delusional person is characterized by a holding false beliefs or judgments about external reality that are not held despite inconvertible evidence to the contrary. In other words, in other words, if everything else says one thing, a delusional person will still believe what they believe. And, 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 and you ever dealt with them? They, they, it's, it's hard to deal with a delusional person because facts don't matter, right? They, they, you can't reason with them. They, 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 they see the world a certain way, and you can't get over it. Well, today, today, we're not dealing with a delusional, delusional person. We're dealing with a delusional church. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, starting with verse 14. Let's pray. As you turn, let us, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, have your way. Use me, Lord, as never before. Speak through me as never before. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be holy and acceptable unto you, my rock, my strength, and my redeemer. Lord, use your word to comfort us. Use your word to convict us. Use your word to encourage us. Use your word to expose us. Use your word, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit to expose in us areas of our lives where we have been delusional. And we will give you all the honor, glory, and praise. This in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. As always, the structure of these letters have always been the same. It always starts with an introduction uh, of Jesus introducing and he using a title for himself. And every letter was different. Um, this morning it says, he is the words of the amen. Which, which means the faithful and true witness. He, it, 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 he's establishing that God, what God, what Jesus says is faithful and it's true. And we can trust in what Jesus says to this church. And not just to this church, but he's, and, and not to just these people, but to everybody. Because the next clause says the ruler of God's creation. And, and before we move on, I, I love how he starts it because he always reminds us who Jesus is. Jesus is the faithful and true witness. He is the ruler of God's creation. So, so if we don't get any encouragement, just remember, he is the ruler of God's creation. That means no matter what happens in this world, he still rules. No matter what happens, worldwide pandemic, God was still on the throne. Uh, anything having flu outbreak, God is still on the throne. RSV is bad, bad right now. God is still on the throne. Surgery's coming up. God is still on the throne. And so no matter what, to this church and to us, we need to remember that God is still in control. And, and, and then he goes on, he says, I know your deeds. That ye are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Verse 16 says, but so because you are lukewarm, neither cold, hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Uh, there is a lot of theories about what this means. Uh, the first one is, Laodicea, let's talk about Laodicea for a second so we understand the city that we're talking about. Laodicea was a very wealthy city. 
It was a center of banking. It was a center of medical research when it comes to eyes. They, they had medical eye ointment for, that they would produce. And so a lot of people would go to Laodicea to get this eye, what's called eye salve. Uh, um, they were also uh, a big uh, in the dyed wool category. So, so, so back then, you know, you got to think about it. Dyed wool wasn't a big thing, but they had black wool. They, would, they could dye it different colors, and, and, and that usually was a sign of money and, and royalty. And so they were a center of this. And so because they were on a, a – where they were located, people would come and go. They became a, a commerce center. And so they had a lot of money. They were wealthy, and they, they were good. They, they had it all under control. But, but not only that, they were situated between two cities, Heropolis um, and Colossae. And, and, and the interesting thing about Heropolis, Heropolis was known for hot springs. Hot springs, like, like, kind of like hot springs, Arkansas. They, they had these naturally hot springs. And, and back then, it was, it was understood or thought that that hot springs had some medicinal value to it. It, it, had some, it had some healing properties to it. And so, so hot springs were, were in um, Heropolis that was about six miles one direction, six miles north. And then to the south, about nine miles, is Colossae. Colossae was known for cold springs. And, 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 in, and in the same way with hot springs, Cold Springs had some medicinal value to it as well. And, and so Laodicea is right in the middle. And, 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 and it's kind of like this verse. With, with, there's, you got hot and you got cold, but Laodicea was, their water was lukewarm. Lukewarm water wasn't good for anything. Lukewarm water wasn't used for medicine. Lukewarm water didn't have a purpose. And, and maybe that's what Jesus was telling this church, that, that your, your lukewarmness, you don't have a purpose. Your, your purpose isn't useful. But then he also says that it's also in the idea of, of getting served a drink. You, you ever ask for cold water and get room temperature water? And you're not expecting it, and you, you drink it, and it would cause you to be like, oh, can I get some ice? Because right. uh, uh, you know it's supposed to be cold, but you're expecting cold. And, and Jesus is telling this church, I wish you were either cold or hot. But you're right in the middle. He, it, it, in verse 16, he says, I know, verse 15, I'm sorry, he says, I know your deeds. And they are neither cold nor hot. If we take it a self-examination right now, and we looked at our deeds, and we looked at how we lived our lives, what, what would classify our lives? Would they be hot, or would they be cold? Hot, hot it, it gives the idea of being on fire or, or, or fired up for, for doing what God has called you. Cold would be the opposite of, of being probably unbeliever and not doing what God wants you to do. And, and Jesus says, I want you to, I wish you were either hot or cold. But because you're in this middle, I, I can't take it anymore. And I'm about to vomit you out. That's what, that's what that, that word spit you out. It, 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 the idea is vomit. I, I'm going to throw you up. And, and I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of kids with a lot of stomach bugs. And, and when, when, when they get the starting to that 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 process, you know it's coming, right? You know it's coming. Even with yourself, you know it. You can feel it coming. But but with kids, you can see it that they they starting to and 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 Jesus is saying, your deeds, how you live your life is causing me to want to spit you out, vomit you out of my mouth. But why? Why does he say that? Verse 17 says, you say, I am rich and have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, 
blind and naked. Man, what an indictment. This is probably the most severe indictment of all the letters we've seen. Uh, of all the other letters we've seen, there was some, at least some commendation and then some indictment. But, but this is the worst we've seen. And, and he says, he says, you say you are rich. Remember, I told you, I told you they were, they were a banking center. They, they had money. They, they, were, they were good. They weren't worried about what they were going to eat. But he says, you, are, you say you are rich. You don't need a thing. And how many of us are walking around now thinking, oh, I got a little bit of money in, my, in the bank account. Got an, I, I got a stable house, stable job, and I'm good. See, see, we, I, I, I don't want to use the word rich because nobody in here is going to say I'm rich. No, nobody's ever going to confess until the, unless the, you're the truly rich. But even the truly rich don't say, that, yeah, I'm rich. But, but if we examine our lives and we examine what we go through, we, we all are rich in this room. We all have it all together. We are all right. You might not have as much as you want. You might not have everything you think you need. But, 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 but we th- we, we, we're, we're all right. In the words of Kendrick Lamar, we're going to be all right. It's, 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 it's an idea and it's a perception of ourselves that we are all right. And, and he says, you say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. In, in Sunday school, I mean, Bible study, we talked about the rich fool, the, the rich young fool in Luke chapter 12, who said, you know what? I'm good. I don't need any apartment. I don't, I don't need, I'm going to build newer, bigger uh, barns to, to, to get all of what I have because I had a good harvest. And now I have all these barns and all this stuff. I, I'm a, I'm a, you know what? I'm going I'm to build even bigger barns. And God said, you fool. You fool. And he told him, today, you're going to pass away, and none of that stuff's going to come with you. So, so we see here, he says, I am rich. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But, but, man, this is, this, is, this is the indictment. You do not realize you are wretched. Wretched man that I am. Who can heal me but the blood of Jesus Christ? Y'all, y'all remember that? Y'all know that song, right? Uh, 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 um, that's the idea of wretched being so distraught, so down, so out of it, so bad that, that you need a savior. And he's telling them, you're wretched, you're pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus is hitting them right where they live, right at the things that they held valuable. Remember I told you they were were known for their eye but what does he say? He says, you're blind. You're blind. You, even though you got all the medical anoint, uh, ointment for eyes and all the, the, the healing that, that has come from that stuff, you are blind. Not only are you blind, you're poor. You're poor and you're naked. You know, the, you know I told you they, had, they, they were known for their dyed clothes. They, they were known for what, what black wool. And so he's saying you're naked. Now, now, but, but here, here, as, as God always does, he gives us a solution. He, look, look what he says, verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Jesus says, you are trusting in these things, but I want you to buy from me. I want you to get from me. I want you to, to, to buy from me. I want you to be rich toward God. We talked about this in Sunday school. I mean, not Sunday school, Bible study. The, the rich fool, he, God told him, he says, I'm going to take everything away from you because you are not rich toward God. What does that mean? 
What does it mean to be rich toward God? We, we're going to, Pastor Miles is going to be teaching Bible study Wednesday, and I hope y'all all get a chance to join because he's going to dig deeper what it means to be rich toward God. Uh, uh, but, but right here, he tells us to buy gold refined in fire so you can become rich. See, Jesus is saying, you, you, you're looking out there. You, you think everything that you need is out there in the world. You think you need that good job to be able to be rich. You think you need uh, uh, what the world provides to be rich. And, and, and Jesus is telling us right here, buy it from me. It, he's not, he, he, Jesus isn't on the corner selling gold and and. and I salve and he, he, he's not buying, selling clothes out the back of his car. No, this is not the idea here. He's saying we're so worried about what's temporal, we're missing what's eternal. We're so focused on what, what the world has and what we can get from the world and, and acquiring wealth. And in and, and, and America, it's life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. We're, we're so worried about living the American dream. We're so worried about having all this stuff so that we can drive a nice car, have a nice house. We can do all these things. And what is this for? When Jesus is sit here telling this church that they're delusional because they're saying one thing, but they don't realize that they are the exact opposite. And that's the worst place to be. And that's why he says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you because you don't even realize that you're in a state that you're in. You're walking around delusional. And we have a lot of delusional church members. We have a lot of delusional people who say they're Christian and go to church every Sunday. But their acts and their deeds are far from God. And, 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 and we see it here. He says, buy from me, go buy the things that are eternal. Remember, he says, I know your deeds. It's, it's the deeds he's looking at. Right. And if our fruit doesn't match what we say about ourselves, then we can't be who we say we are. Right. In other words, only way I can tell an apple tree is an apple tree is if it does what? It bears apples. And the only way God can tell or people can tell we're Christian is if the fruit we bear. And the thing about the fruit we bear is it's the Holy Spirit that wants to bear the fruit in us. The problem is we're in the way. We get in the way and we say, I, no, you know what, I don't want to do it that way. You know what, that person went off on me. I'm not going to be quiet. I'm going to say what I got to say because I got to get this off my chest. And the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, gentleness, patience, kindness. And, and, we, and, and the, the fruit of the Spirit wants to show itself, but, but we say, no, nah, you know, fruit, no, nah, mm, gentleness ain't the time right now. I got something better. And, 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 and we take control. And see, we want to blame the devil for the situation we're in. That ain't got nothing to do with the devil. That's got everything to do with us. And, and, and we're delusional if we think that we can live this Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit. That's why he's saying, buy from me. It's this idea that you come to him with everything, not you not try to do it yourself. Come to him. Come to Jesus, the one who died on the cross for your sins, the one who saved your soul. Come to him. Buy from him. Be rich toward God. But verse 19 says, those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. I don't know if that scares you or, or encourages you, but I, it, it, it worries me because he says, those whom I love, I rebuke. We don't like to be disciplined. Let's be honest. Nobody wants to be disciplined. My kids don't want to be disciplined, and I sure don't want to be disciplined. I don't want God to come down on me and, and deal with me in the way I want. And you know why? Because I'm delusional. I've been delusional about areas in my life that God needed to take care of. And, and, and he's dealing with each and every one of us. He says, he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. We say God is love. But when we say it, we're hoping that God is just the blesser who gives us everything we want. He, he, he just, he'll, he'll, he'll partake and give us the things we, we desire, and, and he'll just make everything easy for us. And, 
and everything. He, he wants us to be comfortable. He, he, he wants us to be um, um, living a dream, and, and he wants us to be blessed. And, and, and when we say God loves us, that's what we think. But when we look at Scripture, it says those whom he loves, he what? He rebukes and he disciplines. The tough times in our lives may not be because of the devil either. But God leading us through things to get us to a place where he wants us to be. See, God's discipline, that's what, that's what I love about Romans 8.28. Because scripture tells us that all things work together for our good. And, and so if all things work together, that means the discipline that he's taking us to taking us through is going to work for our good. Think about your kids. Why did you discipline your kids? You discipline your kids so that they don't do something that they don't need to be doing. So that they can be better for it in the long run. And, and if we don't discipline, you see the, the byproduct of lack of discipline today where parents want to be friends and, and parents want to give everything to their kids and they aren't, they're, they're thinking of love as in terms of giving them everything as, as opposed to love being that they rebuke and discipline. And Jesus is treating us the same way. He's treating this church, but look what he says. He says, but be earnest, be diligent, and repent. It, 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 it doesn't help if we continue to do the same thing over and over. Repentance means that we change first the way we think about it. Some of us have to change the way we think about certain things. We have, we have, we have told ourselves a lot that doing this is okay because the world has said it's okay. Drinking this is okay. Smoking this is okay because the world has said it's okay. You know, the world has, it, it, it's, 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 it's legalized it now. It's not as bad, right? It's from the earth. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I know I'm meddling tonight. I, I know I'm meddling. Uh, uh, but, 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 but it says those whom he loves, he rebukes and disciplines and says be earnest and repent. Repentance means that we change the way we think about things and we turn from it. It's literally a, means we about face. But in order to about face, we have to change the way we think. We cannot take on what the world says because the world will have us delusional. The world would have us thinking that, that things are okay that aren't. The world would tell us that you don't need to discipline your kids. You just need to love them and you need to set boundaries. And you need to do all those things. And, and, and the world will say it's abuse to, to spank your child. Or it, the, the world will tell you the, uh, that all these things that are legalized are okay and it's, it's better. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not one to sit here and say that holistic medicines and all those things are good. I, I, I believe God has placed a lot of things on this earth for, to help us and to benefit to us, be a benefit to us. But we, we, we know that there are certain things that God is convicting us of, and we have turned our, we, we say, you know what, God, I'm, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. It says, be earnest and repent. Verse 20 says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come and eat with him and he with me. This is the promise that I love. See, we've, we've heard this scripture so often be about salvation, but it has nothing to do with salvation. This, 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 this God is standing at the door, and, and, and this is to a church, and, and, and what he's saying is, I'm, I'm, I'm standing at the door knocking, and I, I want you to invite me in. This church was delusional. They were lukewarm. And, and, and because they were delusional and lukewarm, they were doing church. They were trying to live that, this life without God, without Jesus Christ. And he says, I am standing at the door and knocking. But look, here's the promise. He says, if anyone hears my voice 
and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Man, this is beautiful because, because he says, if anyone hears my voice, back, uh, in, 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 back in that time, they would not only knock, they would also yell out saying, hey, uh, uh, maybe they announced themselves. Maybe they were calling for the person that was in the house. And, and, and sometimes I feel like you might, you come to my house, you knock on the door, you might need to yell out too because it's loud inside. And, and, but but it, he's saying, if anyone hears my voice, anyone opens the door he makes a promise he says I will eat with him and he with me this is the idea of intimacy with Jesus this is this idea of intimacy he's inviting us in he wants us he wants to come in to have intimacy with you if we look throughout the New Testament, so much of ministry was done, you know where? Around the dinner table. You look, go, go, go through it and start to see it with new eyes. The, the, the wedding feast at the table, uh, the Lord's Supper at a table. Uh, a lot of things were done around the dinner table. And Jesus is saying, this, and, and in that culture, Hosting people and inviting people in was a sign of friendship and intimacy and, and love for a person. They, they, it's not like today. So, so we got to take our mindset and take it and just put that away. Because our mindset is don't come by my house without announcing yourself. Don't, call, don't stop by without calling me. But see, in this culture, you could just show up at a friend's house and they would invite you in and they would put out a full course meal for you because it was that important to host visitors and to show your love through meals and to through dinner. And, and, and Jesus is saying, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. It's not about eating dinner. He's not saying I'm going to pull up a chair and have dinner with you tonight. He's inviting himself. He wants to come in and, and, and have intimacy with you. Remember, I, I, I say this every week. The the goal, the, the purpose of salvation isn't that we just go to heaven. The purpose of salvation is that we accept Jesus Christ, who is the creator, the ruler of this earth. He is the one that's the goal. He is the one that's the answer. He's the one that wants to have intimacy with us. See, once we become saved, we're always saved. We don't have to worry about our relationship. But, but, but as, as many of you know who are married, your intimacy with your partner could be changed. Things could happen where your, your fellowship, in other words, uh, can be damaged. And, 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 and with Jesus, he's saying, I want to have a deep personal relationship with you because I love you. I care about you, and I want to come in, and I want to eat with you. I want to worship with you. I want to partake in your life and be there for you. And, and I just, I'm standing at this door, and I'm knocking, and I'm calling out, and I just want you to hear my voice and let me in. He wants to come in. How many of us have closed that door? Now, now, now see, with lukewarm Christians, what we think is, we place our faith in Jesus Christ, and we've already let him in. We, we've already, he's already in our lives. He's already in our heart. Why, why do I need to keep? This is a continual, everyday thing. Just like repentance, we, we should be continually repenting. We should be continually inviting and allowing him to come in. Because what happens is when we sin, we, we, we say, you know what, God, I got this, and we kick him out. Now, it doesn't change what the, the Holy Spirit is still inside of us. It, it, the, the idea is called, it's called quenching the Holy Spirit. We, 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 we quench them. We, we pour a little water on them and put that fire down a little bit lower. Y'all know, y'all remember, I, I'm not this old, but I do know about those old um, oil-based lanterns. Uh, I'm, I'm not that old, I, we, I, but, but I do know about them. And they had oil in the bottom of them, right? And if you want it, the, 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 the fire to be higher, you would turn the wick, right? And, 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 but if you want it to be slower, you turned it down, right? And, 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 and that's the idea of quenching the Holy Spirit. You're turning it down so it doesn't have as much to burn. 
and, 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 and you keep turning them down enough to the point where you don't even see the light. You don't even see the fire. And the Holy Spirit, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit is inside of you. But, but we can quench him. We can silence him. We can put out his fire. He, he's not going anywhere. He's a permanent resident inside of us. But we can, and that's, that's the characteristic of a lukewarm church and a lukewarm person, is they, they have quenched the Holy Spirit to the point where they don't, you, we don't hear his voice anymore. And Jesus is saying, I, I'm standing at the door, and I'm knocking. I want you to let me in so I can have intimacy with you, but you're not hearing me. You, you haven't opened the door to allow me in. Verse 21 says, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I have overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. It says, he, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. You know what's so beautiful about this? Because the next clause says, just as I overcame. Just as I overcame and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Look, look, we can overcome not because of us. And I, and I don't want you to think, you know, I don't want you to leave here thinking you can, you can overcome. Because you can't. We can overcome because Jesus has overcame. We can overcome because the Holy Spirit is in us. And the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that rests, rules, and abides in each one of us. And if that power is in us, then we can overcome too. And if that power is in us, then it doesn't matter what happens to us. We know that he's the great ruler. He's going to take care of all these things. So we need to worry about being rich toward God. I, I grew up and heard only, only what you do for Christ will last. I used to always, always hear that. And I was like, what does that mean? And, 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 and the older I get, it, I never forgot it. Only what you do for Christ will last. Only what you do for Christ will last. I'm going to take it a step further. Only what you do for Christ matters. Only what you do for Christ. See, I, I would love to tell you that you could go out and you can live a good life and do everything. You could be very successful. Success has nothing to do with this. You can have all the money in the world and, and be successful, have a big house, cars, whatever it is. It does not matter. But I can guarantee you this. It will not solve the issue you have inside of you. And it will not allow you to do what God has called you to do. See, the only way not to be a lukewarm Christian is to be earnest and repent. To be earnest and diligent about the way we live our lives. To expose and, and offer our whole life to God. See, a lukewarm Christian, we, we give God, you know, oh, yes, I believe in you, Jesus Christ. But, but, but you know, I got these areas of my life I'm going to handle on my own. And there's some areas we got to grow in and some areas that God is continually to work on. And, 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 and we see progress, but, but a lukewarm Christian says, I'm just going to give you this. I'm just going to believe in you and I'm just going to come to church, but I'm not going to allow it to change who I am. And I'm not going to allow it to change how I live my life. And if that's you, if that's your mentality, if that's what we think, if you've been thinking, then, then, then you're lukewarm. And there's no good outcome for a lukewarm Christian. One, Jesus Christ is not going to allow us to continue to use his name and say we're Christian and live way, in ways that's contrary to us, to, to what he believes and to what he has called us to do. That is not going to happen. He is going to vomit us out. We know it. If you don't know it, you know it now. That, that there is some type of judgment coming. 
And I'm not trying to be hell and brimstone, and I'm not trying to scare you. Because here's the promise. Here's the thing that we know about God. God is loving. God is merciful. God is full of grace. And the reason why you're still here is because of God's lovingness, his grace, and his mercy. The reason why you're still here right now in this service right now is because of God's grace and mercy. And he's giving us all the opportunity to make a change, to repent and to be earnest. And we have to dedicate, we have to give it to him. This is why we teach here at New Creation that you need to be in Sunday school, Bible study. You need to be in church because it's the word of God that's going to change your life. The word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. First, we have to have the Holy Spirit. And if you're here today and you're not sure if you have the Holy Spirit, let me give you, let me, let me give you the, the test. The, the test is, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he's God? He's the son of God. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. Those are five things we teach here. If you believe those without a shadow of a doubt, then you are saved. And if you're saved, then you immediately have the Holy Spirit. It's a package deal. You accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in, into your life and he rests, rules, and abides in your life. So if you're here today and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ, today is a great day. Today is a great day. It's no better day than today. But not only do you need to be, have the Holy Spirit, you need to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. We need to submit to his leadership, his lordship. See, a lot of us call Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. But we've never quite cracked open what Lord means in our lives. See, Lord, when you say he's our Lord and Savior, that means he rules over your life. He controls your life. See, we, we got the Savior part down. It's the Lord part we, we, we're struggling with. And, and in order for God and for Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you have to submit to his lordship. Meaning we have to turn over control of our lives to him. But it's so easy and it's so hard all at the same time. The easy part is that the Holy Spirit is in you to do it for you. When I was talking about the fruit, the fruit is not the fruit of Paul or the fruit of Pastor Delaney or Pastor Miles. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit is producing the fruit in you. And you know how that's true? Because if it was left up to you, you would never be gentle. We would never be kind. If somebody came at us, we would go back at them. The fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus Christ wants to be your Lord. He wants to be your Savior. So if you haven't said God, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to, 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 to dedicate yourself to him. New creation, we don't believe in rededication. We only believe in dedication. Because if we were truly dedicated, we wouldn't need to be rededicated. If you're truly committed, you don't need to be recommitted. It, 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 it's, it's a decision, but it's an every day decision. It's not just a one-time decision. You need to make this decision every day. And that's what God is saying. We be earnest and repent. That's a continual thing. Continually. For the rest of your life, be earnest and repent. And it's not that we have to do anything. He just wants to do it through us. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for a moment of silence. I'm going to have Nikki play music. And, if, and I just want to have a moment of silence. Because we ended this. And, I, and I, the, here's the thing. Out of the seven churches, this was the worst of the rebukes. Out of the seven churches, this is the one that I see in America more than anyone. Right. Out of the seven churches, this is the one that worries me. Because we have Christians who think that they're saved. Yeah. And then we have Christians who think that they are, are going to heaven and they, they're delusional. And I don't want anybody here to leave here delusional. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to 
do a, our ending a little bit different. I'm going to pause. I'm just going to have quiet, silence, so that each one of us can examine ourselves, kind of like we do for communion, and just make sure that, 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 that you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And if you do believe, then I want you to, 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 to say, Lord, and, and whatever area in your life that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, I want you to, I, I want you to be willingly, willing, dedicate that to him. See, I can't say I want you to dedicate it to him because you can say all this stuff and you not believe it. I want you to be willing to do it. I want you to say today is the day I'm going to get it right with you, God. Today I'm going to give you every area of my life, every area of my life, even the things that I've been holding back from you, even the things I don't think you can fix. I'm going to give it all to you. So as we pause for a moment of silence, then uh, I'll come and end us with a, a prayer. you're here and you believe in Jesus Christ, we're going to ask that you just come and see one of us elders, Pastor Miles or Pastor Max, after service um, in the fellowship hall so we can share with you what the next steps are. But if you believe that, we don't, you don't have to wait. You are saved right where you sit. For those of you dedicating your life and giving him all, if you don't have a church home, there's no better place than new creation. You need to be in a place where body of believers who can encourage and love you and, and, and help you to grow, help you to, to overcome those challenges. So if that's you, you can also see us after church, and we'll share with you what it takes to be a member here at New Creation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for how, what you have done for us. There is none like you. As the song reminded us, there is none like you. We can search for all eternity and we will find none like you. And we thank you that you are standing at the door and knocking. And all we got to do is open the door and let you in. All we have to do is let you in. And you want to be, have an intimate relationship with us. You already know everything about us. But you're inviting us to know everything about you. And that is the blessing. That is, the, that is what salvation is all about, us being in an intimate relationship with you. And, and nothing can separate us from you, and, and we'll be able to spend eternity with you. And, and everything that, we, that happens to us, we know that you are there for us, and you are there with us. Thank you, God, for how good you are to us. Thank you for how much you love us and how much you have taken care of things in our lives. And you've brought us to this point. Thank you for how you pursue us constantly. The idea of you standing at the door and knocking, you have been doing this for all our lives. And you're just waiting for that moment where we will open the door and invite you in. So, Lord, for those of of us who have made a decision that we're going to give you every area of our lives. Comfort our fear. Ease our anxiety. Help us to trust you. Not just a little bit, but trust you completely that you know what's best for us. That you know better than we know. That you have already taken care of these things for us. 
Help us to be reminded of your word that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That you will never leave us. You will never leave us alone. You will never leave us out there by ourselves. And we thank you. For those who may be uh, placing their faith in you for the first time. Lord, we pray that those of us who are of the body of Christ can come around them and love them and help them and encourage them and disciple them so that they know what it takes to be a, to, to have you as their Lord and Savior. And for those who are unsure and are going to leave here not making any decision, Lord, we pray that you just have your way knowing that you are the great God of this universe and that you will take them through the things they need to go through to make the decision that you want for them to make. Now, Lord, we pray that you just have your way. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for new creation and how you've blessed this church family. Thank you for those who are visiting with us. Thank you for those who have, uh, are with us for the first time and many times. Lord, we thank you for each and every person that's here. Lord, we pray that you just show yourself strong in our lives. And now, who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy to the only wise God, our Father, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forevermore. And Lord, we pray for the food that's been prepared for us. Let it be for the nourishment of our bodies. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.